People saw stains on her body, but they were unable to see scars on her heart. People saw her torn clothes, but they were unable to see her soul tearing apart. People saw her blocked lips, but they were unable to see those hidden tears, all caused by rape. Welcome to yet another episode of Mata Africa. I'm Zoeira Hamza. And on discussing this topic today, here with me is Dr. Oji. Welcome to the studio, sir. Thank you, Zuera. Can we meet you, sir? Yes, um, like you said, my name is Dr. Eji K. Oji. I am the chairman of the Association for the Advancement of Family Planning. I also chair Maternal Newborn Coalition for Maternal Newborn Child and Adolescent Health Accountability Mechanism in the country. And then also I'm the CSO, Civil Society Organization's focal point for FP 2020. FP 2020 is um, an, uh, a global movement to make sure that additional 120 million women and girls have access to family planning services before the year 2020. And Nigeria is a major signatory and had made commitments to that too. Okay. Now, can you tell us about rape and if there are any medical deficiencies that makes one a rapist? Well, the, what is rape? I think we have to get the definition right and I like to bring it down to um, simple layman's terms. Rape is any time before in the penal code it's associated a penetration of the vagina of the woman to constitute rape. But in the new definition, based on the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act, which was passed in 2015 here in the National Assembly, rape is defined as any time you use a body part or any instrument to penetrate any orifice, either man or woman. Before you couldn't rape a man, it's only a woman. But now, a man can be raped. The only thing that is very common in all of this is consent. In other words, if a woman consented to having sex with a man, it's not rape. But if a woman says, I don't want, and then you go ahead and take her by force, it's rape. Okay. The same thing for a man. If a man, and you bring an object or your finger or whatever to put in any part of the man's body or if it's opening, if the man says, I don't want it, and you go ahead, it's rape. But if the man says, I don't mind, it's consensual, it's not rape. So you can see the ingredient, the major strategic or significant significant ingredient is consent. What are the stigma? The yeah, stigmatization is basically one of the reasons why victims don't actually come out to speak out. Why do you think it's so? Um, well, you know, there are a lot of psychosocial uh, pathways, I would say. Um, there's a, a gamut of from normal to abnormal yes. in a human being. But I would say the majority of the rapes that we see has nothing to do with um, people might plead temporary insanity. Okay. Uh, temporary insanity can be pleaded in almost every crime. Mm -hmm. Rape is not different. Uh, that those people are just insane and they can plead it. But the one that we do know that rape, most often than not, is an act of um, power, power dynamics. When a man or a woman feels that he has power over the victim, they exhibit that. If you remember that before now, there were a lot of also young women in some communities, even in this Abuja that we are, mm. about 40, 30, 40 years ago, women were going around naked, just with a leaf of this thing in front of them and at the back. And then their vagina showing everywhere. Nobody raped them because the people, well, nowadays you hear people say the woman dressed in skimpy dresses, yes. and that's what attracted the man. That's hogwash. A rapist is a rapist, it's a power dynamic thing. You know, they want to show that they have power. And you know, there are a lot of gray areas in rape. There is something we call agency in the civil rights activism, feminism, whereby a man can have, um, say, a chief executive officer, and he wants to hire people. And then a pretty girl comes to the office and wants to be hired. So the man now says, no problem. If you want this job, go to them. I'd like to sleep with you or meet me in a hotel. Now the girl is desperate for the job. Maybe the girl has been having sex with people who are not even her. But she will not say, well, 
one more sex, what would, do, what would it do to me? She would consent not because she really wanted to, but she's concerned because she's using that to get something else. All right? In a way, it's defined as sexual harassment, it's agency. All right? So even though the woman said, yes, I want to, that's the fine dividing line. You might not completely say it's rape, but you can define as sexual harassment because you use your power to entice the woman to make her do what ordinarily she wouldn't want to do. Mm -hmm. The other area where consent is not on the table at all is when you have a sexual relationship with a minor. In, in where consent is not the norm, it's when it involves a minor. Okay. And the minor is defined depending on the geographical distribution. Mm -hmm. It might be somebody that's below the age of 16, 17, or 18, but globally, most jurisdictions will want 18 to be the age of a minor below. So even if the young girl coerced you to have sexual intercourse with her, the law still looks at it as rape. It's called statutory rape. The reason is that the world believes that any girl below the age of 18 has not the ability to make the decisions and be able to have the, the presence of mind and mental capacity to make a decision for to have sex. So that's the only way. Consent is not the ingredient, but the age of the child. For now, as far as we are concerned, anybody that is involved in rape is a power game thing. Okay. And like I said, there are some people who belong to a school of mentally destabilized people. And it's not that they are mentally disturbed only selectively for raping. They do all that things that a normal person in the society is not allowed to do. So that one, I can say, yes, is a possibility, but it's not specifically. Almost in every society, any woman that has been raped, uh, people look at the person with one kind of eye. In some cases, they will even say she brought it on to herself. Mm -hmm. I remember when they talked about people dressing in skimpy dresses. And then in some, in some societies, a man would feel if uh, somebody has been raped, it has broken the vow of me marrying a virgin. Uh, so the men would like to marry a woman who, as far as they are concerned, they are the only, only man in their lives, in the woman's lives. And then another thing is, occasionally too, they will feel that the assailants that did the destiny are beneath them. So how could I, in my wildness of imagination, share the same woman with these idiots uh, and all that? So it's a major, major issue, and um, I'm also a sexual expert. I, I train doctors and nurses in forensic medical examination and psychosocial support for rape victims. We, and one of the key things that we try to do is to do what we call look at the stereotyping in the communities, and then we we'll look at the the, what is it that people think about rape in those communities and still, first of all remove it from the minds of the doctors and nurses before we plan what we want them to be doing for rape. And in almost every meeting we've trained in about 15 states. In fact, in the last week of this month we're going to do another training. It's a British Council European Union supported project. We've been doing that for the past three or four years. Um, one of the key things um, when we do stereotypes, you know, myths and misconceptions around rape, one thing that keeps coming up is this stigma, stigma related issue. And that's why most of the women don't come forward to get treated when they are raped or they don't report rape. And that's why even when they're able to come to the sexual assault referral centers that have been set up now in some states, they wouldn't want you to go on to prosecution because in that kind of um, this thing, we have three steps. When the woman comes, medical treatment plus prophylaxis, especially if they don't know the status of the man, they will want to give um, uh, HIV prophylactic um, treatment. And then if the, there was a penetration of the vagina and there was sperm inside it, they want to also do a preventive approach so that the woman can get an unwanted pregnancy. And then, of course, medical treatment for any other thing. There have been cases, I say, a young medical officer, I remember treating a woman that her vagina was completely torn from the beginning to the end. So it was an emergency, we had to suture the woman. So it's important that women get those treatments. 
Then the second part is the psychosocial support. You must counsel the women and make them get um, to understand that this has happened and there's a way they have to get closure. All right? And then the third part is using the evidence adduced to go to court and get their cell and put away. Mm. And then usually what gives closure, psychological closure to the women is when they see that all those have been addressed, especially the assailant being put away. At least it shows that, they are, that something happened to them and something has been done about it. Mm. So myths, misconceptions, stigmatization is a major issue. Okay, let's go on a quick break. Please go nowhere. Welcome back. And if you're just joining us, this is Mata Africa on television Nigeria, and my guest is still much available. Yes, and so it's early education, early sex education, does it actually stop or prevent rape? Mm, I wouldn't say it does because the when you look at the the statistics, almost 95% of people who were raped knew the assailants before then. These were the people they introduced and we are into their comfort zones. So it's only in 5% of cases that they are an absolute stranger. So it's people the people know and comfortable with. But the only thing I always tell people is um, just know that every man you see is a potential rapist. Including your father. I'm sorry to say that because there are a lot of cases of um, 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 should I say incest, uh, forced incest. If it's both agreeing, that's a different matter really, but it's still incest. But in fact, there are a lot of cases that are coming out where young girls have been raped by their own father. So, but the most important thing is that if you feel a bit un unsafe, don't ever, ever get yourself locked in, in a room with a man you're not sure of. Once that door is locked, the man can turn into an animal. So that's the only way I would say the awareness on issues of rape. Just know that it's rampant, that it's possible, and anybody can be the assailant. Okay. Even though the issues of the father or brothers are far and between, but it's happening. Uh, but it's also, I wouldn't want to, a situation where everybody will be suspicious of their father, suspicious <laughs> of their brother. The major fear of a, any woman that has been raped uh, in twofold. One is stigmatization, then the other one is their safety. Okay, the safety, because if it gets out that um, they have been raped, and then they are able to identify the assailant and they are able to talk about the assailant, it might put them in danger. Uh, a good example, let's take for example, somebody has been, elect, has been nominated by his party, mm -hmm. a gubernatorial candidate, and is now campaigning, and everything shows that that man probably is going to win to be the governor of the state. I'm just using that as an example. Yes. And then he goes and rapes a young lady. Now, if he gets out to the open, that's that man kissing that gubernatorial and just bye bye. So the opportunity cost lost by the man, he will wait. Um, should I try to shut the girl up? And shutting the girl up can be so many things. It could be paying the girl off. It could also be getting rid of the, the, the victim. So this is one of the key things that people who have been raped are afraid of. Mm -hmm. So and that's why there's a culture of silence mm -hmm. around people who have been abused. And then of course the other one I talked about stigmatization. You know, the people they are also afraid that it will affect their future relationship with the opposite sex, especially when they want to get settled and get married. So those are the major. Yes, and of course, medically, uh, for when they don't know the status of the assailant, they will also be afraid of um, contracting a sexually transmitted infection. It could be HIV, it could be gonorrhea, it could be syphilis, it could be any other type of bacterial infection. And then, of course, the fear of pregnancy. This is an unwanted sex. 
So it's um, something taken by force. Regardless of how you came, she can still get pregnant. So they also are afraid that they might get pregnant. So if you look at those are the four major uh, fears or phobias a woman would have. Now, uh, currently the National Assembly is considering a stiff punishment to the rapists. What do you think one of those punishments should, should be? I don't know why the National Assembly should be reconsidering it. There's already a law, Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act, which stipulates the punishment for rapists. I don't know whether they did do proper due diligence on their laws before they are talking about it. In the law, if you rape a minor, the judge has the discretion to give you 20 years to life, minimum 20 years, a minor. If you rape an adult, it's minimum 40 years to life. I don't think there's anything stiffer than that. Okay. If you rape and kill the victim, it's no more rape, it's murder. Then you, you will go on the line of murder, that's first degree murder, and that is death penalty. So the, I, I don't know what stiff can be more than 40 years to life or 20 years to life. But the important thing is to make the prosecution much more easier, put the, the enabling drivers to make sure that those people are put away and they're taken away from the societies and communities. There have been reported cases recently about a school in Jabi, the deaf and dumb school, whereby it is actually the teachers that have been molesting those pupils, innocent girls who actually can't express themselves. So how can such cases be curtailed in the society? Well, in such cases, I even call it dub double geopardy for the um, affected um, victims. It's just like things that are happening in the IDP camps in the Northeast, whereby the women have run for their dear lives and they were given safe sanctuary and given security personnel to protect them. They are the ones going to rape them. For that's why we are doing training in that area. I just finished a training in Medigree about a month and so ago. Um, it also goes to speak to the issues of disabilities. You know, we. Most of our laws and, and all our environmental things are done for people who are able. But there's not much that being done for disabilities. And I'm sure, and I'm glad that there is a law now and acts um, to protect disabilities. And that's why, even in the work that we do now, when we're training doctors and nurses, we have brought in issues of disabilities. They are the most vulnerable set of people. A deaf and dumb girl cannot shout. Another girl who has voice can shout. Uh -huh. But this one cannot shout. It's a culture of silence again. But it's, it's a terrible thing. Well, the law, it's not that they're going to apply a different law. It's, the law is there. The same law they will use for people who were, who were okay. It's the same law. But the only thing is that with the discretion of the judge, the judge might decide to give a more stiffer penalty mm. to the assailants. Instead of giving 20 years, they might give 40 or even life. On a final note, what advice do you have to young ladies? those that are raped and those that are yet, that are not yet raped. Well, the advice I'll give to them is that it's always good to seek medical treatment first. Don't go to the hospital, to the police first. Mm -hmm. Unless the police has been trained to have a rape protocol. And what we mean by rape protocol, there are deliberate step, next steps the police has to do. Like if it's in America, if a woman reports rape, they call him the rape squad. The first thing they do is to take samples and then make sure that the patient gets medical attention before they start putting together a case against the assailant. In Nigeria, the British Council will support with the Europe, from the European Union. is doing a lot of trainings and helping set up sexual assault referral centers across the country. And we've trained in about 15 states as we speak. Now, those sexual assault referral centers are uh, specialized centers where if any woman has been raped, that's the first point of call you should go to. When you go there, there are doctors trained in forensic medical examination. They will properly examine you, document it in a way that it will make sense in court. And at the same time, they give medical treatment and there are counselors there too that they give psychosocial support. And then put the person on a, on a program, making sure that they have um, um, psychological support out too. Mm -hmm. You remember the case of um, one pastor that was accused yes. of um, rape by one 
one of the, the ladies recently. A lot of women, which is surprising to me, I said, uh, why did she wait for so many years to come and start shouting rape? The reason is simple. That woman exhibited the classical, the classical um, psychological outcomes of a rape, a rape victim. Number one, once a woman is raped, the first thing there's an acute phase, which is physical and emotional. The physical one, of course, is physical. If you take care of it, it starts a bit. But the emotional one can last up to, the acute phase can last up to two weeks. And after that comes um, a, a state of disorganization. Now, this disorganization can last for months. Then come a third stage we call reorganization. And this reorganization, the woman is now trying to accept what has happened and try to put it behind her, start doing, you know, um, occasionally we move away from the environment, occasionally send, change their phone numbers, you know, try to get back to normal life. But usually you can see that something is going on, they might be overeating, they might not eat a lot, they might be abs uh, upset minded, they might, might even affect their work. Then the one that is long lasting 10, 20 years, they call the underground stage. Mm -hmm. Now in this underground stage, the woman will be in self-denial. And then when it surfaces very acutely, if the woman, if the rapist was wearing a particular fragrance of perfume, once the woman smells that fragrance, it brings back the memories of what happened 10, 20 years ago. So they are in perpetual mental torture. In one case in Enugu, a young woman that was raped didn't go through all this psychosocial support that I was talking about. Ten years later, she ran into the gentleman that raped her. She ran into a room, in a wedding reception, she ran into a room. You know what she was looking for? She was looking for a, a knife to kill the guy and then kill herself. She became suicidal and also became a violent person. In fact, up, leading up to that point, she slept with any man that came her way. She was drinking heavily, she was smoking weeds, became a drug addict because of the psychological torture that she was going through. Then got to be a suicidal but also wanting to kill the guy first. What saved the day was that she couldn't find a knife in the room and then she now got a better part of herself. You know, woke up from her slumber, so to speak, and then um, that was when she now had to seek for help. I came to the session, I saw the referral center in Enugu called Tamasak. So she, we brought her to one of the trainings we had in Enugu to animate the suffering these girls can go through so that the people who are training can appreciate better. So that woman that accused the seven pastor, it's possible that he's going through that phase. So when people say, why should she wait for so, so, so. And another thing is that they might be suffering. There's no space for them to speak up. Yes. There's no support for them to speak up. Fortunately, she had a very caring husband who she was comfortable with and shared her experience. And the man said, look, you have to speak up. We can see that the husband gave her all the support through the time the thing was in the public news. So he's... he's um, uh, the only thing I can say that is it's important they seek for a proper center where somebody properly trained in forensic medical examination, psychosocial support will take care of them. Thank you very much, sir, for your time. And that's the much we have today on Mata Africa. And ladies, don't let other people tell you who you are or what you can or cannot achieve with your life. You have to decide that for yourself. I'm Zoya Hamza. Thanks for watching and bye for now.